Generally speaking, when we think about snakes, the image that springs to mind is perhaps a corn snake or maybe a garter snake. So basically something long, slender and pretty much featureless. But what if I were to tell you there are snakes so bizarre that even their general outline doesn't match these familiar species? Well, if that sounds interesting to you, please stick around because today we're going to look at the top 10 weirdest snakes in the world, starting with number 10, the northern rubber boa. So this is typical rubber boa behavior. They are extremely laid back, extremely relaxed animals, very, very docile, so much so that their main defense is having a blunt tail that looks a lot like their head. So really their main, <laughs> their main way of sticking up for themselves is hoping that predators will be fooled and that they'll attack their tail instead of the head. And that, you know, that's kind of weird. It's not really weird when you think about it. The weird part about this species is, to me anyway, where they live. It's a boa that lives all the way into Canada. And now, I mean, the rest of us in other parts of the world, we have this kind of stereotype about Canada that it's minus 20 every winter and, you know, you think of snow and, and mountains pretty much. Um, but in Canada, there is a boa, there are scorpions, there are rattlesnakes and there are trapdoor spiders. And I think that is pretty weird and it earns it a spot on this list just for being able to survive so far north and do so well. Next up, number nine, the tiger keelback. So what would happen if you were bitten by that snake? That's a great question. It is a hemotoxic venom, very similar to the venom of a boom sling. What that will actually do is get into your system and it will begin to hemorrhage you, right? So that means you'll be bleeding internally. So it is a very, very bad bite. One of the most venomous snakes that they have here in Japan. What's very unique about this species is not only is it venomous, it's also poisonous. They have two glands right on the back of their neck. And what they'll do sometimes, if they feel threatened, is puff themselves up and these glands will actually eject poison. Guys, as I often tell you, never try to handle snakes. It's always important to properly identify them first. Never, ever, ever try to handle a venomous snake the way that I am right here. Being poisonous and venomous at the same time is an excellent technique to survive, basically, um, and it is pretty weird, but there is something else that a lot of people don't regularly point out with a tiger keelback that makes it even more weird. So it's an extremely successful snake, thanks to this strategy. Um, you can find it all the way from, I guess, Vietnam to Japan and perhaps into Russia. Um, but the weirder part is that these snakes that we have in Europe, like the grass snake, and the snakes that we have in the US, like the garter snake and water snakes, are actually related to this snake. They're all in the Natricine subfamily. Um, they're quite closely related, but it just goes to show in tropical ecosystems and even ecosystems very far removed from what you're familiar with, things can be different. So it's always good to watch out and be careful. Anyway, just the fact of being poisonous and venomous for me, that earns it a spot on this list. Now for number eight, egg eating snakes. I haven't got sound on that clip, unfortunately, um, but what we're watching is essentially one moving in this way and rubbing its scales together. And there's another one doing a fret display as well. And what that does, it makes this sound called stridulation, which is a term that just means rubbing on something to make sound, and it mimics the sore scaled viper. And I guess, you know, that's an okay defense mechanism. Uh, and that's, um, it's obviously helped it to survive because this species and its relatives have spread, you know, quite far across um, Africa and the Arabian Peninsula. But I find the defense mechanism interesting. I know everyone was expecting me to put up an image of one eating an egg, <laughs> um, but we know, we know they eat eggs. So basically eating eggs is an extremely smart, extremely, I don't know, successful way of life really, because um, eggs are just full of good stuff. They're a superfood and that goes for animals as well. So, I mean, from a dietary point of view, that's amazing. They have these bony structures called hyperpophyses, which jut down from the lower half of their, well, the underside, I guess, of their neck vertebrae, and those structures actually bust the eggs. But to get the eggs in their mouth, because these are small snakes, actually, they have to lose their teeth. And that is the whole problem with being an egg-eating snake. You don't have fangs, you don't have venom, you don't have teeth, you've got no defense at all. So yes, eating eggs is great, they do really well, but the flip side is they have needed to develop a defense mechanism. Now for number seven, flying snakes.
I did actually go over flying snakes um, in a recent video that I did, so I'm not going to dwell on them too long. But I mean, we can all say that it is, it is a weird thing to do, a snake to, to glide essentially. It's pretty simple how they do it, their ribs are very muscular, they can flatten themselves out to become basically like, like a ribbon and just glide. Um, but that's not really what I found about them to be the most weird. The weird part for me was the whole ecosystem they were in. So when I went to Borneo years and years ago, um, there weren't just gliding snakes or flying snakes. There was a lot of mole crickets flying everywhere. There were Draco lizards that also glide. And something I'd never seen before was flying um, stick insects. So I was wandering around one day and something whizzed past my head. It was really long, I didn't know what it was. And I only looking past further down, I saw it was a massive stick insect. And I'd never seen an area where everything flies all the time. I'd never seen mole crickets fly that often. I'd only seen them on the ground. I'd only found a few in my lifetime, really. So the fact that they fit in with this, there's this whole ecosystem out there where gliding and flying is really, really important. I found that to be quite weird and quite interesting. So now for number six, a very interesting snake, but also kind of a, I guess kind of a problem snake, the Brahmini blind snake. One rare fact about snakes is that some species, like the Brahmini blind snake, are parthenogenic, meaning females can reproduce without the need for males. They lay eggs, which hatch into offspring that are genetic clones of the mother. Parthenogenesis is an excellent way to reproduce when you're a very, very small animal. Uh, I mean, looking at that second clip, you can tell how absolutely tiny they are. I think maybe they're the second smallest snake species in the world. I'm not entirely sure on that one. Um, but yeah, when you're that small, imagine your nearest potential mate is 100 feet away. That's That could be heck knows how long before you can actually reach them. So parthenogenesis is great for animals that are very, 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 very small and might not be able to find each other. The flip side of parthenogenesis is that it's also excellent for colonizing new areas. So landing on a new island and immediately reproducing there and populating it. And this is why the flower pot snake, as a lot of people are now calling it, has actually spread around the world. <laughs> so it's not supposed to live all around the world, and it does. And it spread so far that we've even had cases of this snake turning up in Kew Gardens here in London. So it's a fascinating animal. It's amazing what it does. But yes, it's now become invasive. How harmful can it be? I honestly don't know. It really depends whether it carries specific parasites or anything like that. So now for number five, the Arabian sand boa. I'm not going to dwell too long on the Arabian sand boa because I recently did a good segment on one of these in a, in a video I did maybe just a few weeks ago. Um, I'll link to this video below and you can probably check out that one to hear a bit more details. But I mean, just looking at it, it obviously had to have a place on this list. Um, by the way, it's probably a good time to say if you do enjoy this kind of content and you're enjoying this video, please do comment and let me know because the more comments I get, the more it's pushed by the algorithm and the more that lets me know what direction I should be taking things. So it's really helpful. Thank you. Now for number four, the Madagascar leaf-nosed snake. This snake is a master of disguise by also looking incredibly stupid at the same time. This is the Malagasy leaf-nosed snake and they are made to look like a stick or tree branch. They spend almost their whole life in trees where they usually stay hidden. They are ambush predators and use their disguise to prey on small reptiles like lizards. They are non-aggressive like most tree snakes and not harmful to humans. Fascinating stuff. What we have going on here with this species is quite interesting. We've got two separate things going on. So obviously it's using camouflage and crypsis. Camouflage is to blend into to colors, etc. Crypsis is to break up the outline. And that's, you know, we've seen that with lots of animals. We can understand that pretty easily. Um, the second thing going on is sexual dimorphism. The male is the one with the pointy nose and the female is the one with a kind of rough leafy kind of nose. 
And sexual dimorphism, I mean, when it's mixed with crypsis like that, it's really fascinating. So the way we understand this is, this isn't certain, but in animals like that where the male has that rostral appendage and he's got the brighter colours, the condition of his bit of camouflage there and the condition of his colours could advertise to the females how strong and how healthy he is and how good of a potential mate he is. So this could literally be of the males using camouflage, crypsis and what we call honest signalling, so advertising their quality to females all at the same time. And that is pretty weird. Now for number three, the spider-tailed horned viper. This snake is unbelievable. It is the spider-tailed horned viper. It has a distinctive spider-like tail. The tail even has a bulbous section that resembles a spider's abdomen. When hunting, the snake hides in rock crevices for camouflage and waves its tail back and forth in a manner similar to the movement of a spider. This movement attracts birds searching for prey, as spiders are a food source for many bird species. Once the bird approaches, the snake quickly strikes it and injects its venom, which paralyzes the bird and allows the snake to devour it. In science, or in biology I should say, we call this type of trickery, this type of luring, caudal luring. It comes from the Latin word corda, which means tail, and corda luring, you know, it occurs with quite a few species, so the deaf adder in Australia uses it, um, baby cotton mouths, no not cotton mouths, baby copperheads I think use it as well if I remember correctly, maybe the cantil as well, I'm not quite sure, but anyway, it happens in lots and lots of species, and usually it's done with a wiggling of the tail and a combination of coloration, so a bright yellow tail for example. What is really unusual about this cord luring is just how good it is. I'm, I'm kind of blown away by just how much it looks like a spider and the movement. It's just an exceptional case. And I mean, you know, a snake with a tail that looks like a spider is extremely weird. And I think it completely merits the uh, third place on this list. Now for number two, the elephant trunk snake. All right, listen, I didn't want to have to do this, but you leave me no choice. Here comes the smolder. Well, what can I say? That's a very cute snake. <laughs> um, so the, the outward appearance of the elephant trunk snake looks very, very strange. They look baggy and they look just not very good really. <laughs> um, but it's actually extremely smart as well. So they have very rough sort of sandpapery type of scales. Um, not really sure how to describe them. But using that in combination with the baggy skin does something incredible when they constrict fish. Now they don't constrict fish to try and suffocate them, they constrict them to try and get a grip on them so they can't get away. And they're extremely fast and extremely muscular and very, very strong. But basically when they grip the fish, those folds of scales, because they're so uneven, I guess, with all the skin, it gets as much contact with the fish as possible. Imagine a fish is kind of up and down and you didn't have those folds of skin, you'd get kind of two points of contact or three points of contact. But with all those folds, you get all contact around the whole body of the fish and it grips it extremely well. It's like having your finger in one of those finger traps we used to get when we were kids. Or back in my day we did anyway. Um, so yeah, that's an extremely incredibly highly specialized snake for the aquatic lifestyle and what i would just add on this one is that i've seen that guy get a few comments on his account about oh you shouldn't take it out of water etc and i think with some animals it is true that their lungs are very you know specialized for breathing while they're underwater or partially submerged or whatever but i'm going to go out on a limb and say personally given how incredibly strong these snakes are um and how much muscle they have in them i don't think having it out of water for a minute or two or just you know 30 seconds like he does i really don't personally think it's going to do it any harm that's just my opinion right so now we are at number one probably the most specialized or one of the most specialized and weirdest obviously the weirdest but possibly the most specialized snake on the planet this is a highly unusual animal this is the tentacled snake 
Let's talk about another animal that you have probably never heard of. This one is an extremely lonely member of the snake family tree. It's the only member of its genus. It is the tentacled snake. They are entirely aquatic, so aquatic that they give birth to live young, which is something that aquatic reptiles often evolve to do. But they've also evolved some hyper-specialized tentacles on the end of their snout. These snakes live in the murky waters of Southeast Asia, and they almost exclusively eat small fish, and they're really good at it. Small fish are hard to catch, but these fish are great at it because of those tentacles. If I slow it down, you'll see. Watch carefully, the body moves first, it causes the fish to react, and then the snake is predicting where that fish is going to be. They know fish have a C response. They turn in that C shape. So by using those tentacles, they are able to locate the fish with such precision that they can cause that little bit of motion, trigger the fish's C response, and then predict right where that fish is going to swim. The tentacled snakes and the small fish are a classic example of an evolutionary arms race that's led to some really interesting new novel structures. What an incredibly good piece of content. I'm glad I featured it. Everyone, if you are on TikTok, please go and give that guy a follow. Um, so the tentacles on the snake's rostrum there, on the snout, are what we would call mechanosensory organs. Mechanosensory organs are any organ that feels heat, touch, pressure, um, I'm not sure if pain is a similar class, probably forget about that, but definitely anything that feels a pressure or a touch. Um, so we could say that our skin is in many ways a mechanosensory organ as well because we have mechanoreceptive cells. And that's amazing, that's incredible, but what we need to understand here is the other half of the story. Uh, so what the fish have, they're in the bony fish group, they have what you call the lateral line system, and that's a line of specialized cells down each side of their body, which are like a little gel cap with a hair sticking out of the end. When the hair is moved at all by movements in water, it triggers the cell below, which is a mechanoreceptor, and that sends a signal to the brain. And that's how the fish can feel any movement in water around them. And that's how the snake's movement, its initial movement, triggers the C response in the fish. So we've got a highly specialized system in fish, which is great. And then we've got a snake, which has said, I'm gonna go one step further and has ended up with tentacles on its face, <laughs> um, which is, makes it the weirdest looking snake on the planet, pretty much, um, but also makes a great topic to, to learn about if you're interested in herpetology. So there we have it. That was the top 10 weirdest snakes that I know of. If you think I've missed one, please do comment and let me know because I'm sure we could add another 10, 15, 20 to the list possibly. But most of all, if you did enjoy this, please do like and share and comment and subscribe and come back in a week or two, I'll do another video, and just, as usual, just let me know what you want to see. Thank you very much.